that he's given and done for us during and over the past week. Uh, I have a few announcements for you this morning. Ash Wednesday is right here upon us, amen? amen. In um, a week or two, there, a week and a half is Ash Wednesday. And you can pick up your, we'll have package, a packets for you to pick up for Ash Wednesday on um, that Wednesday, the first Wednesday, the second of the month, the second of March at the front door. We'll be stand, I'll be standing there. God gives me strength. I'll be standing there so I'll be able to hand you your ashes. Length Bible study will start March 3rd, 12 noon or 6 p.m. We'll have two 12 noon or 6 p.m. And uh, if you're interested in, in studying with us, please call the office and uh, sign up. Let me just say there is absolutely no reason why committees are not re meeting. Absolutely no reason why all of our committees are not meeting. You can call the office and get a Zoom link from Michelle, and Michelle will pass that link on to all the committee members. Let me say amen for you and for myself. Immigration Clinic, March 19th. Immigration Clinic, March 19th. If you know anyone who is interested or need to see an attorney for immigration purposes, please see Cindy. Soup Bowl, we're still taking donation for Soup Bowl, even though it was over last week, we still are taking donation. We can always take donations, amen. Don't forget about, um, please don't, we have two fundraisers, I don't wanna call them fundraisers, let me say ministry needs, two ministry needs. And one is we're still working with the, uh, the sound, uh, communication in the in the church and as a matter of fact we got a donation this week in the mail for that praise God and so we ask that you give but we're asking we're asking 40 members to pledge a thousand dollars I see hands going up all over the church yes I do or 80 members 500 give whatever you can for our transportation ministry. We need a new van. And I'm saying 40, but uh, the trustee committee said 60. So give whatever you can. God will um, bless you. We appreciate it because we need to continue to do the ministry of the church. We, need, we don't need to stop. And we don't need to make excuses that because of COVID, we can't do. We still can do during COVID. So we ask that you bless the Lord at all times because he's blessing you at all times. Amen. A wonderful good morning to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to be here this morning on behalf of the Christian Education Ministry team. We will begin confirmation classes in March, the third week in March. I have six names so far of students, six through 12th grades who need to be in confirmation classes. We did not have confirmation classes last year because of COVID. Confirmation classes will be virtual. They'll be online from 10.30 to noon. Please call the church office or see me after church and give me your child's name so I can put your child or your grandchild on the list and I'll send you the Zoom link. I thank those teachers who have volunteered to work with our students on confirmation. A reminder, teachers, that we have a meeting this Saturday at 10.30, and I will send out the Zoom link for our teachers' meeting. Also would like to remind you that if you are so-called to join 
our fellowship here at First United Methodist Church. Please see me so I can get you registered in new members class. Thank you for your attention to these announcements as we turn now to worship the Lord. Have a wonderful and blessed worship service. Good morning, First Church. I apologize. I'm just making a really brief announcement, inviting all of you to the scripture reading ministry. Every Sunday, lay readers participate in the public reading of scripture from the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. Scripture is carefully and prayerfully selected ahead of worship to be a part of our learning, praise, and worship every week. I know we all like to exercise our rights of free speech, well, Moses, the disciples and apostles, and of course Jesus performed the most divine form of free speech that was meant to benefit the hearer for abundant life and hope with amazing grace and love. The first time you hear about the public reading of scripture in the Bible is in Exodus 24 by Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai. And Moses took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And then we hear the public reading of scripture from Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And at the closing of the Bible in the book of Revelations, we hear the inspiration Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. As United Methodists, our standards affirm the Bible as the source of all that is necessary and sufficient unto salvation, and is to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and practice. We invite everyone of you here today to be a lay reader, not out of duty, but out of your love for the one who has saved you and given you this day, to do so out of desire to grow in relationship with God and to share the word of God with the people of God. The sign-up sheet for the scripture reader ministry will be in the rear of the church. We also email the order of worship every week, so if you're not on our email list, please let us know. And I thank you for taking the time to listen to this announcement. Please enjoy this worship service. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Good morning. Please bow your heads and open your hearts as we join in prayer. O oh, precious and gracious Lord, we thank you for this day, for waking us this morning. Thank you for seeing us through another week. Thank you for this time to gather together to praise and worship you, to give you all the honor and glory. Lord, so many of us are struggling right now. We are in the valley feeling alone. Send angels to reach out to us. Bring hope to those who feel, the, feel no hope. Let us remember we are never too busy to reach out to someone, to bring them hope, that yes, we need you, but we need each other as well. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. Let there be a song, a word that touches us. As we leave the sanctuary today, as we begin a new week, let us be the smile that brightens someone's day, to show appreciation to that worker who may not feel appreciated. Let our touch, our hug, be the one that tells another, you are important, you matter, and I care about you. As we leave here today, let us take our blessings and share them with others. May we show our love for each other to spread the love of Jesus, for it is the love that drives out hate. Let your light shine through us, for it is our only light that will drive out darkness. It is in the loving, powerful, marvelous name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, good morning, First Church family, friends, visitors. I know that a lot of you probably don't know my name, but I know yours because I've been sitting out front just taking attendance, and I'm very happy to do that. I want to thank you all for coming and sharing this spiritual moment with First Church, both near and far, and I'm, I'm welcoming you on behalf of I'm illustrious minister and senior pastor, Yvonne Wallace-Penn, and Reverend Stewart on this, um, how can I say, last, almost last Sunday of uh, uh, Black History Month. I know a lot of history has been shared over the last maybe three weeks as to what pioneers have done, but we have a pioneer of our own. Our illustrious minister and head pastor, Yvonne Penn, has been highlighted in the newspaper of Hyattsville Life and Times. She has a very lovely picture of her standing at the pulpit, and I think they're copies of her paper outside at the, uh, I guess, the attendance desk, and you can pick it up and read it at your leisure, but it gives her a little bit of her history uh, that most of us, I mean, myself, didn't know, but very impressed, and she has taken this church to a higher level. Hyattsville has been my home for about 20 plus years. And I came to First Church on one of the health and wellness fairs, and I never left. So you know that's, that's, a, um, that's a milestone for me. And I hope that all of you all can read the article, get a little bit of information as to what she has been up to over her, her pastoral journey. And I want to make sure that, <coughs> excuse me, that everyone knows that I am very proud of Yvonne Wallace Penn. But in the meantime, thank you for being here, far and near, and I hope you enjoyed the service.
church. Good morning, church. Okay, my name is Olubanke, and I'll be reading the Old Testament. I want you to hear me well. Can you hear me well now? Yes. Better. Okay, we're going to be reading from Genesis 45, 3 to 11, and then we move to 15, to verse 15. So, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come, closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry. Go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there since there are five more years of farming to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, First United Methodist Church of Hyersville. I will be bringing you the gospel lesson this morning coming from the book of Luke, the sixth chapter, the 27th through the 20 to the 38th verse. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strike you on the cheek, after the other, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you will have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
It's time to give. <laughs> I, I feel so good this morning to see so many of you. It's God. But um, I feel extra special because I know that the word of God is going to be broken with you today. And you will not walk away empty. That I do know. You will not walk away empty. If you uh, have a pad, you can take notes, a pencil, you can take notes because God is going to do something extra special for every single one of you today. I believe that in my heart. Amen? Now, now you don't have to amen. You don't have to say hallelujah. You don't have to say thank you. But I believe in my heart that God is going to do something special for everyone every single one of you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Amen? Amen. Also, I, I know that um, Angie told you about the, the newspaper uh, article. I didn't even want to read it. Donna Lee made me read it. That, that's the absolute truth because I don't like to read about myself. But uh, they sent some, a couple of folks call and ask, could they have a paper? And we do have some on the front desk as you walk in that you can pick up. If you would like a copy, you may do so. How you feeling? How you feeling? Let me ask that one more time. How are you feeling? I feel good. Can we bow our heads together? Lord, you have done so much for us. You have opened the windows of heaven and you have poured us out blessings on top of blessings. We ask you, dear God, now as we give from our meagerness, as we give from our last coin, as we give because we know it's right not to receive anything back, but we just give because we want someone to be blessed. We want someone to be fed. We ask that you will bless us. Continue to bless First Church abundantly. We know you will. We give you praise and we give you thanks. We thank you for being here today in the name of Jesus. Amen.
May God bless those who are able to give and those who are not. Amen. you all in the name and spirit of Christ today as we celebrate another Sunday in this Black History Month. As we come today, we 
come as one who has suffered much. And I must say to the congregation today that this is not one of my better days. Uh, I have had less money and felt better. <laughs> but today is good to be here with you. I have been undergoing some health issues. And for those of you who have any experience with any of the elements of gout, you know that whenever those that uric acid crystallizes, you can't stand the cover of a sheet to touch your toe. Well, my, uh, it seems as though if it's not one thing, it's another. So it moves from fingers to hands to elbows to knees and now in my ankle. That's why you see me on a cane uh, because it's hard to walk. And if any, given all other things, I probably wouldn't have been here today, but I said, I'm not going to do that. And it's strange when you come to church there's always healing. Uh, when I pulled into the parking lot this morning, and my wife was wondering if I was going to be able to get out and come in, and I got out, I brought the cane, but I was moving so fast, my ankles was feeling so good. <laughs> she said, you don't need to run, you know, because... <laughs> but it's good to be here with you today. I, I talked to... Uh, uh, our music director was in part of our Bible study last week, and I said I was going to call him this week and suggest some songs for this Black History service uh, uh, today. But uh, I wasn't feeling that good during the week, and I didn't do it because I was going to have him to play some swing low, sweet cherry oak coming for the cabin me home. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long ways from home. And, uh, you know, those kinds of songs. And even when those songs were sang by those who were enslaved, uh, it wasn't a denial of their condition, but it was an affirmation that trouble don't last always. So at the end of those things, when they sing them, sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home. But at the end of that, they always ended with glory, hallelujah. Again, knowing that the presence of God may be with them. I want to read for you today a portion of scripture from St. Luke's Gospel, the 21st, ver 21st chapter, beginning at the 10th verse, and you'll find these words. Nations will go to war against one another, and kingdoms will attack each other. There will be great earthquakes, and in many places, people will starve to death and suffer terrible diseases. All sorts of frightening things will be seen in the sky. Before all this happens, you will be arrested and punished, you will be tried in your meeting places and put in jail because of me. And you will be placed on trial before kings and governors. For this will be your chance to tell about your faith. Don't worry about what you will say to defend yourselves. I will give you the wisdom to know what to say. None of your enemies will be able to oppose you or to say that you are wrong. You will be betrayed by your own parents, brothers, family, and friends. Some of you will even be killed because of me. You will be hated by everyone, but don't worry. You will be saved, being faithful to me. What Luke is telling us, by your endurance, you will live. You will gain your life. As I said, Black History Month is a month 
of history. And we relegated that, as was mentioned the other week, by the pastor, Carter G. Woodson, started this. We had, a, we had a, started with a day, then we got a week, now we got a month. But uh, if you really know it, next month is Women's History Month. And, you know, and in all of this, you wouldn't need these special emphasis if all of the truth was, were told in the beginning. And so that's why we have to lift up a week or a month or to talk about history that's not really history, specifically black history, but it's history that has happened but has not been acknowledged. So we, we do that, and blacks have contributed to a lot of things in this country just as women have, and that, but we celebrate it. So as we come, they don't want to teach it in school, uh, and it's a part of American history. They don't want to talk about slavery, saying that we are putting people against each other, polarizing people. And if you know where the country is going, there's no, well, we won't get into those kind of arguments. But we need to know what our history is as it has contributed to each other. So today, the, my title today is I come from a long line of black preachers. I grew up in Virginia, and uh, we have a lot of preachers in the family, and I, it was one of the things I said I was not going to do, but it wasn't my choice. The Lord directed me to do it. It wasn't my choice. I ran away from it, and I didn't want to do it. But when I go home, not even to a family reunion, but to a church service in some of the churches that is populated by a lot of my family, if someone were to ask, we will have prayer now by Reverend Stewart. About eight of us might get up if they didn't mention the first name. So it's a long line of black preachers in my family. So today our message is faith and the black preacher. For the black Christian experience in America is basically an experience of repression and oppression. But it is also a glorious experience in that it has given to black Americans a tough and rugged faith. That's why we can say glory hallelujah at the end of a hymn when we know that we have been mistreated in all of the contradictions saying we were not a human. But even when we sang our song and our hymns, we were able to say glory hallelujah. A new understanding of the meaning of love, universal oppression, soul identity and the courage to be for generations armed only with the grace of God and the unique qualities of the gifts of blackness in the days when hope unborn had died. It was the black preacher who enabled the woebegone masses of black people in this country to transcend the vicissitudes of life, to trace the sunshine through the rain and look upon the world with quiet eyes and tranquil soul when the total environment conspired to rob black people of humanity and the distresses of racism clogged their minds, dimmed their spirits, and told them that they were nobody. It was the black preacher who saved their souls and sanity and told them that they were somebody because they were children of God. To the despondent masses of black folk, they were able to pers persevere. Those who live by faith. The black preacher gave realism and substance to things hoped for and a taste of things not seen. He was part of the trend travail uh, of, of his people. For whatever happened to his people happened to him also. And whenever, wherever they were, he was there, kneeling on the cold dirt floor of a slave cabin, working in the hot, dusty field, walking the lonely wilderness trails to get to his church and people, going into the valleys where they had to hide you know, they were allowed, 
blacks were allowed to, to go to church with the white folks, uh, but they were relegated to certain areas and the worship just didn't suit them too much. So after that service, they used to sneak out into the valleys and the ravines where they had that invisible church where they could shout and say hallelujah, jump up and down, run and do all of those things, you know, out of the eyesight of the masters and those who control them. Man of God by calling, but often teacher, healer, carpenter, and undertaker by necessity. It was he who took down the mutilated bodies of black men after the mobs had done their work. It was he who represented black people to the hostile white community. In times of deep trouble, he made life a little less tedious. And the and the hard journey a little less trying. And when a child was born, he was there to bless and to cheer. When death came close, he was there to guide and comfort. When food and hope ran low, he was there to bring faith and assurance. He knew fear and loneliness, pain and trouble as often as any of his flock, but from his lips always fell words of comfort and reassurance. His bones were just as numb and his muscles just as tired and sore, yet he went among his people serene and calm and cheerful. Why? Because he had faith in God that trouble does not last always. He was frequently without the necessities of life, but never without the dignity of his office. He was often without honor, but never without integrity. He was a poet, a philosopher, an orator, and a prophet, always declaring a better day is coming. Unfortunately for the masses of black people, this tradition is still with us today not kneeling on the cold dirt floors of slave cabins, but in overcrowded ghettos and rundown, roach and rat infested shacks in those ghettos, no longer in the hot, dusty fields of, of a sudden plantation, but in the hot, smoky steel mills and the foundries and the factories that they work in. No longer worshiping in busy harbors and fields, but in storefronts and cathedrals. The black preacher of today can be found in the forefront of the faith for liberation and empowerment. And they are in black caucuses and coalitions. In the tradition of the black preachers of the past, today's black preacher can be found wherever wrong reaches for justice, wherever the poor seek jobs and food, and wherever oppressed people cry out they're hurt. Black preachers of the day can be elected to the Senate of this United States. Black preachers of today and yesterday make up, made up their mind that they were going to follow Jesus regardless of the dangers, struggles, and persecution. They were and are determined to stand firm and win true light for themselves. We can think of those preachers who participated in the Birmingham bus boycott when those with Dr. Martin Luther King and other ministers got together to make change, they were aware that even though there may be dangers and persecution, but that God was with them. Jesus warns his disciples concerning the approaching danger and the hostility of both Jew and Gentile. 
as they attempt to carry out their ministry. They will be accused of heresy and of sedition. They will be persecuted. They will be forsaken. They will be cast into prison. Jesus is a realist, and he didn't try to reduce, seduce his disciples by holding before them the pleasant prospect of a successful ministry. He lifts the veil and he insists that his disciples face the dark realities, the fiery persecutions, and the struggle. He reminds the disciples of the ultimate danger which the Christian faith placed upon them, and that with the way of the cross which is an indispensable and inescapable part of their lives. And they were, in a real sense, his followers. And being such, they were called upon to share in his suffering. And though it all, it all he, he assures them of a promise, a most universal promise, in that he believed that through ordeals which they would encounter a great blessing would be theirs if they persevered if they stayed on track and didn't give up he says to his disciples in your patience you shall win your soul what Jesus appears to be saying to his disciples is more than the exhortation to be patient under the pressures of persecution and peril Jesus does not bid his disciples to possess their lives in patience. He said something far more fundamental and striking than that. He said that it was by patience and endurance that we are to get possession of our lives. Patience and endurance that we might get possession of our lives. In other words, by your endurance, you will win yourself life. Man has the tendency to believe that life is given to him complete and not as something given to him to win. To be sure, our lives are not to us ready-made, furnished and complete. They have to be made. Our souls are prizes to be won. We do not start with them, but rather we gradually gain possession of them. The soul is not an inheritance into which we are born. It is something we make and fashion and win for ourselves out of the varied disciplines and experiences of life. We win our souls and our lives by the manner in which we handle all of the vicissitudes and the difficulties and the tensions and the raw experiences which life throws at us. You see, there is a big difference between possessing, possessing a thing and making it entirely your own. I, I might possess a book. I may even own it. But the, the winning of his treasure is quite another thing. I have to read the book first. I may possess a musical instrument, even own it. But to win his secret melody is quite another thing. I have to play it first. To win the soul is to bring all of its rebel powers into willing homage to Jesus. To win the soul is, is gradually to constrain all that is within us to praise and bless the name of Jesus. By your in endurance, you will win yourselves life. The black chief, the black preacher accepted Jesus' glorious promise as he embraced the Christian faith, firmly believing in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. He believed in the fatherhood 
of God and the brotherhood and sisterhood of humankind. He longed for the day to come when men and women, boys and girls, could live as free children of the Son of God and each person respected as a brother and a sister for whom Christ had died. But in order to do this, even to believe this, he had to endure and in his endurance, in his capacity to survive, to stand a persecution, to bring a message of hope to those who existed in despair. He was able, by the grace of God, not only to win his own life, but the lives of the members of the black witnessing community. James Weldon Johnson portrays beautifully the effect the faith of the black preacher had on the witnessing black community in his prayer poem, Listen, Lord. So he penned these words, Oh Lord, we come this morning knee bowed and body bent before that throne of grace. Oh Lord, this morning, bow our knees in some lonesome valley. We come this morning like empty pitchers before a full fountain with no merits of our own. Oh Lord, open a window of heaven and lean out far over the battlements of glory and listen this morning. Have mercy on proud and dying sinners, sinners hanging over the mouth of hell, who seem to love their distance well. Lord, ride by this morning, mount your milk white horse, and ride this morning. And in your ride, ride by old hell. Ride by the dingy gates of hell and stop poor sinners in their headlong plunge. And now, oh Lord, this man of God who breaks the bread of life this morning, shallow him in the hollow of the hand and keep him out of the gunshot of the devil. Take him, Lord, this morning. Wash him with hyssop inside and out. Hang him up and dry him by dry sin. Pin his ear to the wisdom post and make his words sledgehammers of truth beating on the iron heart of sin. Oh Lord God, this morning put his eye to the telescope of eternity. And let him look upon the paper walls of time. Lord, turpentine his imagination. Put perpetual motion in his arms. Fill him full of the dynamite of thy power. Anoint him all over with the oil of thy salvation. And set his tongue on fire. And now, Lord, oh, Lord, when I've drunk, the last cup of sorrow. When I've been called everything but a child of God. When I've done traveling up the rough side of the mountain. Oh, Mary's baby. When I start down the steep and slippery steps of death. When this old world begins to rock beneath my feet. Lower me to my dusty grave in peace to wait for that great getting up morning. Amen. Amen.
I might own a clarinet. Oh, no, no. I might own a Steinway. But unless every day I sit down and begin to work with the keys, you won't enjoy the melody that that Steinway will bring you. If we don't begin as people of God to seek he first the kingdom of heaven, and when we go on the last mile of the way, huh, will we be able to rest at the close of the day. I love when pastors say that. You may own an instrument, but unless you put the time in. Ah, come on, my sisters and brothers. In order to see the face of God, anybody know what it is to come up the rough side of the mountain? Anybody know what it is to pray and it seemed like nobody was hearing, not even God himself. But then all of a sudden the heavens burst wide open and you begin to see the glory of God. Do we have anybody in here this morning? Anybody this morning that know about the glory of God? Pastor, I invite you to come and just say thank you, Lord, for bringing me through those nights that I never thought I'd wake up in the morning, for protecting my children when I didn't even know where they were. I didn't know how my rent was going to be paid, but somehow, some way, it got paid. Anybody this morning, the altar is wide open. I didn't know how I was going to put food on the table. But food was provided. The altar is open. You may come. You may come. You may own a Steinway. <laughs> But unless you put the time in, you're not going to be able to enjoy the music that Steinway can produce. The altar is open. You may come. And this morning, holy God, we bow before you. <laughs> we bow before you, God, because you are the giver of everything. When we were weighed down in Egypt land, told old Pharaoh to let your people go. When we were on the cotton fields, oh God, our hands bleeding, you came along and you touch and you heal. And this morning, God, together as we serve you, as we worship you, we're still scarred. Oh, 
all of us, we have scars from just living. There are wars and rumors of wars going all around us, oh God. It's not on the battlefield, but it's when we step outside of our individual or collective homes. Sometimes it's right in our church, oh God. But you are the one that is able to move everything out of our way. You're the one that is the great provider. You are the one that is God Almighty. And beside you, there is no other. You are the one that is able to call night and day. And at night, oh God, when we lay down and our hearts are heavy and the tears won't stop coming, you are the one that comes along and dry our eyes. And so this morning, oh God, we're calling on you. Lord, here we are, wounded, tried. But we know a God that is able to keep us from falling. We know a God that is able to lift us out of the moray clay. We know a God that is able to touch and heal. And so, if our hearts are broken, we know you are the great healer. Sometimes if our mind don't feel right, we know you are the mind regulator and whatever we need, oh God, you're there to provide. You told us to seek and we will find. So we're seeking you. None of us want to leave this place the way we came in, but we want to leave oh so much better. We've had food to take us through the week, but we want to be able to call on you. Just say, Jesus. Thank you for healing babies this past week. Thank you for healing those in the hospital, God. Thank you for, for providing as we have seen this past week. Thank you, oh God. And when our hearts are lonely, when our hearts are lonely, we allow your angels just to stop by and put a song of springtime in our hearts. This morning, we honor you, we praise you, we love you, and we adore you. In the precious, precious, mighty name of Jesus, we are now receiving everything you have in store for us. Amen and amen. God, if I fail to ask you to just touch Pastor Stewart and bless him right now as he receives his healing, please forgive me. But publicly, I ask your God to touch him as he receives his healing from you. In Jesus' name, amen.
And now may the peace that heavens bring, may the river that flows and wash your soul, may the God of grace and eternity touch us as we're healed. My sisters and my brothers, will you go in peace knowing that God is with you. Amen and amen.